So a question that I get asked all the time, everywhere I go and do events, is how did I get to be so cool? And <laughs> the answer is that I was not always so cool. Um, this was me at 13. I look like I'm about eight. And I was like a late bloomer in every sense of the word. This is me at 15. I still look like I'm about eight. I still haven't hit that you know, goal of puberty. So it should come as no surprise that I became a very heavy reader. Didn't fit in at school, Sit. didn't really Sit. have friends. Sit. She's my friend now. <laughs> you weren't around 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so I read, and I read a lot. And my favorite things to read were books, fantasy books, books like Lloyd Alexander, uh, Tamara Pierce, Madeline Langle. And, and Sabriel and Garth Nix. These are sort of these classic fantasy series that I read growing up. Um, I don't know if kids still read them. I hope they do. And one series I got really obsessed with was a series by a famous fantasy writer named Anne McCaffrey. And she had a young adult trilogy with the first one being called Dragon Song. And it followed this, like me, awkward teenager who didn't really fit in and nobody really liked her. And then one day, as fate would have it, she discovered these cool little miniature dragons and now it's up to her to save the world. And for me, you know, at age 13. Why is that a moment? Why is that what? A moment. I no idea what you're saying. Um, it's just a picture. It's just a picture. It is. It's just a picture. It's the cover of a book. Hey. Just listen. Just listen. Um, I just, it's okay. Right? I just want to see the pages inside. Oh, I don't have them. That's you, just a you picture. You know what? I bet they have it at the library that you can see here. We'll go look at it later. Mm-hmm. Um, this book, I really identified with the heroine. Um, and, and many fantasy books, it's sort of up to the loser Come character in the world. And so as, you know, this uncomfortable, you know, preteen teenager, I started to write something called fan fiction. And I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's essentially where you write stories in a pre-existing world with pre-existing characters. So one of the really popular fan fiction bases is for Harry Potter. So um, I'd say it's probably the biggest in the world. So if I wanted to write Harry Potter fan fiction, I could write a character named Susanna, and Susanna would be off saving the world. She would totally be a Ravenclaw, and she would help Harry and the gang defeat you know who. Or maybe she would, I don't know, have her own adventures in Hogwarts. But the general idea is that this world would already be built with the characters, and I could write stories in that world with those characters and sort of create my own plots. And that's a really great way for beginner writers, and I think every author I know started writing fan fiction. It's a really common sort of starting point for young writers or older writers, any age, um, because it's, it's comfortable and it's easy to write in something that's already built. All you have to do is come up with a story. So I wrote not fan fiction. I wrote this Anne McCaffrey dragon fan fiction. I wrote Harry Potter dragon fan fiction. I wrote the most embarrassing of all, in sync fan fiction where Justin Timberlake is <laughs> mad in love with me. Um, Daddy. That was Hi, also Daddy. when he was still in sync and not that old. <laughs> now he's famous, so I'm fine if he's still in love with me. Uh, so I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, and I started to get more courageous and write my own stories. A lot of them were still kind of copycat stories where I, you know, I'm, I'm still mimicking something, even if it's got different names, it's still a rip off of Harry Potter. But that's also the normal progression for most authors. You just sort of, you know, it's training wheels as you get more comfortable with writing. Then I went off to college, and my plan was, I thought I would learn to write. I would go to school and I would become an author, and it would be great. I would be famous and published. But when I actually got there, it turns out I was really a gigantic wuss. And I realized I was going to have to share my work if I was going to school for it. And that terrified me because once you share your work, what if people don't like what you're creating? Um, what do you do then? And, and then what if you realize they don't like it because you're not good? And then what? What do you do then? And it's all this gigantic fear of being rejected and 
fear of ultimately failure. And so I did not go into writing. Instead, I went into marine biology, which is completely different. <laughs> um, and don't get me wrong, like, I loved marine biology. It turned out I was really good at science, and I was good at math, and I liked that. You know, there was no creating and feeling vulnerable. It's just numbers. You just analyze and interpret. And I got to go all around the world with marine biology. So this is me in Belize. That's off the coast of Georgia. These catfish can be like 60 pounds. Uh, I went to Antarctica, went to penguins. And then I went to the Arctic, and then lived on sea ice and caught sharks. And so it was really great in that I got to do all these things that the normal person would be scared of, unlike writing, which I was still too scared to do. But hey, being on sea ice and peeing in a bucket, I can do it. <laughs> so as I did these things, though, I sort of you know, toughened my skin and became a bit braver. And as many people do, I met a boy who was awesome, and I fell in love with him, and we got married. And I moved with him to Germany. And that was good, but I couldn't get a job in marine biology because we were living in the Alps, and I didn't speak German, and so it was, it was time to go back to my first love of writing. And also, like, we lived next to a castle. That was the castle next to our house. And it's like one of those where it's like, wow, who, you know, am I ever going to live in something this cool? I have to write. I have to use this. This is inspirational. It's my fairy tales. It's great. Don't be afraid, right? If I can live on the sea ice, I can totally write a book. Um, so I spent, I don't know, a while sort of working myself up to that, to trying to actually write again and do it for real this time. Because I wasn't so scared and I was ready to take that step. So again, this is me on the sea ice with little sharks. If I can do that, surely I can write a book, right? So I taught myself. As the scientist brain, I was going to come at it from you know the left side of my brain. I was going to be organized and I was going to do it right. So I'm going to teach myself about writing and then work out my courage even more as I learned about it. So I spent, I don't know, a while taking workshops and reading books and learning how to write. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote a lot. Um, and each new story and each new chapter built up my, my confidence. And then one day, I had a dream. So I have very vivid dreams. I don't know if you all do, but I do. And I tend to remember them. So I write them down when they're especially sort of haunting. And then this dream, I dreamt the, about a girl whose brother was missing. And the only people who could help her were these ragtag people um, with special skills. And I was actually working on a different story at the time, um, a fluffy contemporary chiclet of all things. I don't even read that. I don't know why I thought I could write that. And I, this dream, it wouldn't leave me alone. So I wrote down the basics of it in a dream notebook that I keep, and then thought, I'll just ignore that. But it wouldn't leave me alone. This idea wanted to at least be flushed out. So I finally gave in and dropped that chiclet, which was terrible anyway. And threw myself into this, this beginning of an idea. But I needed a setting, because my dream was vague, hazy, you know, a combination of images and feelings more than anything else. So I knew right away, the first thing I had to do, scientist Susan said, we need a setting, we're gonna get on Wikipedia, and we're just gonna search through settings until we find one. And I knew at, at first that I wanted it to be steampunk. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Um, but, well, there's a steampunk sort of contest going on right now. But it's this idea of sort of Victorian um, clothing and technology, but also a lot of crazy gadgetry, um, oftentimes powered by sea. And just this sort of dark and gritty um, aesthetic vibe to it. And I really like that, um, visually anyway. I really like movies like the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes or League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but actually writing a book with steampunk is not as easy to do because you can just throw that up there and like, wow, that looks cool. But when you try to write that into a book, you're like, why is there a mechanical hand in gears? What do the gears do? What's the purpose of it? And it can be quickly bogged down. So I thought, all right, steampunk light. We'll do like diet steampunk. 
Now we just still need a setting. So I search through Wikipedia, doing the usual, you get on Wikipedia and then you like click another link in the, in the text, then you click another link and you just keep going until eventually you get somewhere that you think feels right. And what I found was this international exhibition, 1876, so it was the first World Fair in the United States, and it was in Philadelphia. And it was basically like Disney World of 1876, kind of like Epcot, because you know cultures from all around the world came for this. They set up their own little buildings. They had all of their technology on display. And Philadelphia built basically an entire town just for this to house all these these creations and um, various artworks. And thought, wow, that would be a really cool place to sort of set my story. Um, just because it just seemed like a really rich setting to bring to life. Love you, Dad. This was actually the opening day of the Centennial Exhibition, and they had a million people come. One day, the first day was in May of 1876, um, and just like look at all the parasols. That's so cool. <laughs> uh, so that was Memorial Hall. It's the only building that still remains from the exhibition. Everything else was torn down, but it's still in Philadelphia, and there's a museum at the now. Um, and I would like see it. So yeah, they like really went all out though. You can tell it's not a minor building to create just for this exhibition. This is the inside of uh, one of the halls called the Steering Hall, where a lot of buying book happens. And I don't know if you can tell, but it's just a bunch of inventions basically laid out. You would walk through and see, you know, munching on popcorn or the new invention, which was ice cream floats. You would have your ice cream float and you would look and see a brand new thing called a typewriter. It's like enormous, probably the size of that thing. Um, or they had the first Alexander Randolph, the first uh, telephone there. So things like that. People just yes. got to walk around and see and be awed by how clever and brilliant, you know, especially Americans were. <coughs> uh, this was literally like Epcot. It was the main hall of the Centennial Exhibition, and each country oops, had their own little area set up. So you could go around and see sort of cultural icons from each place. And the one that people were really fascinated by was Japan because nobody in the U.S. had ever seen um, a Japanese person before, like other than people who had traveled to Asia. Actual Americans had never seen the Japanese, and the Japanese have a, a thing here, and they also had their own little building, um, and it, apparently Americans were just fascinated by this, these people and their culture, and so, you know, people would come just to see people who come from all across the country to the Centennial Exhibition just to see these other cultures. And this is something that is in the book. It's this hydraulics annex, this is what they called it. And it was this sort of gigantic pool full of fountains because all the machinery, of course, was steam powered and that had to be, that required 